I'm here in Santa Barbara, and I have the privilege of speaking with Alexandra Merce. Hi, Darren. Some of you will know her as Tesla Boomer Mama. True. <laughs> and our topic today is what happens to Tesla stock after it gets investment grade credit rating. Alexandra is a Tesla investor, yes. and she's worked in the financial markets from 1990 to 2007. How do you know? That's including true. five years in Moody's Investor Service from 1998 to 2003. Exactly, exactly. It was actually six years because it really started at the beginning of 1998, ended at, at the end of 2003, yes. Thank you I for being here. Media. I love it. Thank you for coming here. Live in her iconic studio. So this is where <laughs> you actually film all your videos. I film my videos with a fake background. So you're the only one who really sees how it is. Yes, it is. This is actually my office. So uh, I do my videos here as well. That's true. It's beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I like I like Santa Barbara a lot, and uh, I have my little corner here, which is nice. Yes. So I drove here on a Tesla Model Y for the first time. First time driving the US with left-hand drive. Autopilot brought me to oh, you. True, you're usually not left-hand drive. Yes. Right? Oh, so you had it all. Commonwealth countries. Well That's done. Right. <laughs> well done. Can you tell us how did your journey with Tesla begin? Sure. So uh, we're Europeans, I'm German, my husband's French. We moved in 2014 from Europe to uh, the United States, to California, and we wanted an electric car straight away. So there were no Teslas then that were the size what we needed. We started with a BMW i3. Um, and then in 2017, we had a reservation for Model 3, but that wasn't ready. So we changed for a Bolt Chevrolet for three years. And in 2020, we changed finally to a Tesla Model 3. Um, and had a test drive before taking it. And that test drive was the moment that was in March 2020. So we had electric cars, we knew what it was all about. Um, but um, sitting in that car was just immediately instantly a love story. We understood that it was more the software than the hardware, we had the instant talk, everything was just absolutely mind boggling. So came back home. And from that moment on, we've gone all in on Tesla. So that was in March 2020. And now, not everyone knows, but you also have a Model X as well. Oh, we do. So we're actually at number four now. So the first Model 3 was supposed to be a two-year lease. But in a year, our son, our 19-year-old son, had put so many mileage on it that we had to already give it back. So we changed that one to a second Model 3. And we took three months after that first Model 3 in 2020, in August 2020, we took a Model Y, which we absolutely loved. And now we upgraded to an X long range. Um, and I still have a little bit, I mean, I have no regret because the X is just beautiful, but that Y was really a perfect car. Driving one right now, mm. totally agree. Oh, it's the, the size, the performance, mm. um, the screen. I actually think the software is better in the Y than in the X. The X is a beautifully finished car, um, but I mean, the Y value for money, that's it. Agree. And it's not so expensive that you want to be so gentle with it and make sure everything's it's okay. It's a good car. What's interesting is many original Tesla investors like Dave Lee, he started investing in Tesla after experiencing the Model S in 2012. Mm. You've actually experienced a whole range of EVs, not just Teslas, yes. that gave you a conviction to yes. begin your journey. Yeah. I mean, for us, EVs was, was a clear choice, but we have five children, so the Model S was not a choice because it was just too small for the whole family or it was too expensive a car for, you know, in, in the we needed three cars. Um, and um, and so when we actually had the Model 3, it was incredible what an upgrade it was compared to the Bolt and, and the BMW i3. And that I think that's even more convincing because you knew what electric cars was, were all about yet you were still astonished on the upgrade it was to be in a Model 3 compared to the other cars. There is no substitute for experiencing yourself. True. And True. companies like Tesla make great products. And with that, many people believe that it's a matter of when and not if that Tesla will achieve investment grade credit rating. Yes. Apple achieved investment grade credit rating only in 2013, mm -hmm. six years after the launch of iPhone. Yeah. Which ridiculous. is insane if you look back at it right now. Mm -hmm. Why the urgency for Tesla to get investment grade credit rating? Well, um, is there an urgency or not? That's the big question. But I mean, the thing is, it is deserved. It is overdue because now for three quarters, financial results are so outstanding 
that it, it's really ridiculous that the rating agencies don't give Tesla uh, uh, an investment grade rating. The, the issue obviously is that Tesla doesn't have any debt. If you have debt and you need a rating, you pay the rating agencies. If you have no debt, well, you don't pay the rating agencies. So are they in a hurry to do it? Obviously not. So it, it should be independent of that, but it is not. So we're pushing, we're trying to push, market is pushing. And I, I feel it is imminent. I do believe it will come in the next six weeks for S&P. But it's true, it is over to you already. No doubt about it. It's better when some people believe that you can actually short circuit the process. I believe in a video with Gary, mm -hmm. Gary Black mentioned, if Tesla just takes on some debt, pay them, triple A investment grade. That's, and that's exactly what happened with Apple. Mm. So Apple, what they did is after six years of not having it, they gamed the, the game, what I always call it. Um, they called the rating agencies in 2013 and said, you know what, we're going to issue a huge bond. We want to be rated. And miracle, they were AAA. Wasn't it beautiful? They went from junk directly to AAA just because now it was a bond issuance. And so once that bond issuance was out, uh, Apple was on top of it even more clever because all the money from the bond issuance they used to buy back stock and retire that stock. So that reduced the float of the of the stock of the apple stock increased the price obviously at the same time we'll probably talk about that a little bit later institutional investors went into into apple massively so you had more buyers less stock and your triple a wasn't a beautiful coincidence all manufactured that's what you call financial engineering it's a virtual cycle mm. but i feel someone like elon just for by the principle of it wouldn't want to play that game that's possible i mean i think there are two ways of seeing it. Either Elon would think, yeah, they're just stupid and they're irrelevant and I'm not going to play the game. Or he's thinking like Apple did in 2013, let's be smarter than them and outsmart them and do exactly what they want, but go beyond mm. and take advantage of it. I don't have an opinion, but I mean, he does because obviously he said Moody's is irrelevant, right? He answered to one of those uh, tweets that we regularly did and where we actually show the correspondence. I had inquired with Moody's and with S&P why they are not upgrading um, the uh, Tesla and uh, Moody's replied back, a completely stupid answer. We got all excited, Dave Lee got excited about it and whatever, and uh, Elon replied, Moody's is irrelevant. There we go. <laughs> so different founders have different mindsets. Mm -hmm. When we talk about institutional investors, they still rely a lot on these credit rating agencies. Yes. You've mentioned before in the past that the biggest catalyst for institutional investors to start getting into a stock is inclusion into S&P 500, yes. which happened for Tesla in, December, ago. in this December 2020, yes. Now, how much more would an investment grade credit rating and ESG help with additional flows of mm -hmm. institutional investors? So ESG currently not that much. ESG is still a topic well, there are a couple of billions of dollars in it, but it's, I don't think it's going to be the major driver um, if it is an ESG upgrade. And, and ESG is a, is a complicated subject. The credit rating upgrade, I think, is actually going to be significant. It will not be as instant as the S&P 500 inclusion was in December, because what happened that day, the, the funds that are indexed to S&P uh, 500 had to the same day all purchase, right? So you knew there was just this mass of purchases going to be there in December 2020 on one day. With the investment uh, grade rating, it's different. Once they are investment grade, they will become eligible of pension funds, foundations, uh, fiduciaries, uh, financial advisors now suddenly telling their clients or telling their fund managers, yes, you can buy uh, Tesla. Then it goes through committees, then they have to do analysis. So I do believe the impact is more gonna be over six to 12 months of institutionals purchasing the stock, but the market will anticipate that. So the day you will have the first of those rating agencies announcing that the, the investment grade has been obtained, there will be a swing in the stock price for sure. How much will you see this impacting the stock price? And also building on this, is investment grade credit rating a lagging indicator of strong business fundamentals to begin with? Oh, sure. So is it more a correlation versus a causation mm -hmm. of stock price growth? Well, no doubt credit ratings is old world, it's lagging, and it's just not up to today's standard. Why? Because 
up to 20, 30 years ago, when financial information was still sparse, they had their raison d'être, they had their, you know, they, that, that was their existence, knowing more than the other people. Today, anybody who has access to internet knows more than them. If you compare the level of knowledge in the Tesla Twitter community compared to those Moody's and S&P analysts, it's just, it's ridiculous, right? So yes, they're lagging. Uh, but they're still consequential because there are still lots of people depending on those great ratings. So is it something we should completely ignore? In reality, it should be completely ignored, but we can't because we're not the whole own market. We have to either succeed in educating the rest of the market, say, telling them, look, don't look at this anymore. Don't look at these credit ratings. Look at Altman Z or other scores or do your own homework. Um, but that is, you know, for us who are so concentrated in Tesla, we have the time every day to go and get this new information, process it and whatever. A fund manager has to look after 30, 50, 100 stocks. So they have to have that same time span and that's just impossible. So they use other indicators and unfortunately also still the, the credit ratings. Sounds like they still play a big role, but as Elon mentioned, and you quoted earlier. Oh yeah, I have to show you this. So I don't know whether that, do you want to approach it maybe a little bit closer? So one of my followers sent this to me. So this was the, the um, tweet that um, Elon replied with uh, to uh, that Moody's response. And uh, one of my followers were kind, was kind enough to project this on a cup. And now I have the mug on my desk. <laughs> which is nice right it's elon's quote moody's is irrelevant it is some people feel that we should just divert our energy instead mm -hmm. to work with these institutional investors to not blindly follow these credit rating agencies yeah what is your take well we're trying to do that so one one step we've done for example is contact yahoo finance and said to Yahoo finance how about you cover the Altman Z score? The Altman Z score is not perfect either, but it is much better than any of those credit ratings. Um, what really would be helpful is Yahoo Finance or CNBC or any of the other large retail data sites covering a couple of indicators in a specific part of their, of their um, display so that investors can quickly understand you know, how good or how bad the credit situation of this company is because credit ratings are not called credit ratings for nothing. They are supposed to tell you how secure it is to purchase a bond from this company, how sure it is that they will reimburse at the end um, their debt. And, uh, and, and those indicators, they're much better indicators than credit ratings now around for that. But we need to make sure they become easily understandable, easily accessible. So we have done the first step, contact Yahoo Finance and reached out to CNBC. The next thing we're going to do is prepare letters for investors so that they can use those templates to write to their pension funds or to their um, fund managers and say, look, if you still use credit agencies, please stop from doing so use this and this method instead. So we're trying to be really proactive, helping people, you know, push because this has to come bottom up. It's it's just not going quick enough. Congress in America in 2010 um, ordered the SEC to tell everybody not to use credit ratings anymore. We're now 12 years later. This is still not implemented. So I just don't think it will come top down. So it has to come bottom up. Many of us also feel passionate to, to play our part to help here. Mm -hmm. Are there any specific state or like teacher pension funds you know where they have a mandate? We can only invest in a company if the credit rating is investment grade. So I did some research. I mean, it's very difficult because there are so many of them, but I went um, in detail into the Cal Purse, which is all the, the um, public servants in California. Uh, they have the credit rating only for the shorter investments but they do they do have anything that they invest in i'm not talking about stock but bonds anything they're investing up to 15 months has to be credit rating this is the most progressive the most educated i mean this is hundreds of billions right of money that for their short-term portfolio still have to go with credit ratings so that's one thing you can do around the world there's different nuances in different countries as well yeah for our friends in the credit rating agencies mm -hmm. some of them may feel like I, I feel like I'm the bad guy. I feel like I'm a bit left behind. Mm. How do you see that whole industry evolving and changing and moving forward? Well, they have to get quicker, first of all. They have to clearly get quicker, but they also know 
that their days are counted, right? Because they know this law uh, came from Congress that they shouldn't exist anymore. I mean, not that they shouldn't exist, but there should be no obligation to use them. So um, what they're doing, those credit agencies are uh, um, diversifying and their biggest diversifier is ESG. Now, my opinion on ESG is very complicated. But but what is for sure the case is they are trying to replicate this dependence that people have on their credit ratings now into a dependence on their ESG ratings. And since ESG for me is an even softer subject, you can even more manipulate rather than with financials, right? Financials, you have a ratio, that's it. You have 10 ratios and you have 10, but I mean, still only numbers, right? ESG is about being good, good in terms of environment, of social behavior, of governance. So all this brings with it that it is just getting so much more complicated to understand those scoring models and be sure that they're objective. So I'm a very, very big opponent from, uh, from, from ESG ratings. And uh, we have to be very careful with these as well. I mean, anything that ca uh, has a scoring model can be gamed. And that's the big problem with all these scoring rating agencies. And as you mentioned before, it comes back to okay, how are these companies making money? What's their business model? Mm. And as there's more subjectivity, true. you can't convince them, yeah. confuse them. Yeah, that's true. Tesla competes with companies from all over the world. They've got planet-wide ambitions. Mm -hmm. And some of the biggest car and autonomy companies in the world are based in China, mm -hmm. like BYD, SAIC. Mm -hmm. How much impact do credit ratings and ESG play there? That's a very good question. I, I don't know as much about China as I should, but um, it seems clear that economies that are younger, like the Chinese, don't have this historic dependence that America and Europe had on those credit ratings. So while in America, this is like 120 years, these credit ratings have been around and then they actually got mandated by law at one period, I mean, now we're trying to get out of it. Um, it. There is this dependence, there is this sheepness behavior that was just put in place. I have the feeling in younger economies like the Chinese, this has never come up. You know, there is not the same. There are actually a couple of Asian rating agencies, but they're much more on their toes. I, I see them less and there's also less dependence on them. So while I actually think it is good that people do a credit analysis, it's the rating itself and you said it, the business model behind it, this whole interference of you pay me to be shown well, it's just not clean. And I do believe China doesn't have that problem at all yet, but it's also true. China has a much bigger dependence on the state. So lots of companies in China, I don't think can actually go bankrupt because the state is behind it and will help them. Here in America, companies have traditionally gone bankrupt. And so that that risk is much more present here than it is there. It's different, not just economic, but even political systems. Mm. And also just different maturity True. plays a role in how credit ratings and ESG play out. You've been our lighthouse, kind of like our tour guide in this whole adventure that is still <laughs> playing out, working with the credit rating agencies. What is your biggest learning so far? from the whole conversation with Moody's and S&P on Tesla's credit rating? Um, I think that the most evident is that they're just not playing by the same rules, right? Um, when somebody has a lot of that works with them to be rated, has a traditional relationship with, with these rating agencies, they are rather better served than somebody who has no debt who is a quick growing company. I do believe these rating agencies have a huge problem in grasping what exponential growth means. Um, and then therefore the, the whole uh, analysis is screwed towards something more negative. They don't understand it. They can't deal with it. They can't compare with it. They're not paid for it. So all the negative elements pull the grade downwards, where for others, where it's more traditional, they're more used to it, they have a positive communication flow, it's screwed more positive. The only thing is the investor knows nothing about it. All they see is triple A's, double A's, B's, whatever, right? And that's where the problem starts. So this journey continues to, to play out. Mm. And it's not just informative, that's entertaining, but you're also shedding light behind the scenes, what goes on here. 
I mean, it, it is true. It brought me my little fame. I'm always laughing about that because I mean, I, I have no clue why suddenly I'm close to 15,000 followers and whatever, but people seem to be interested in hearing about this. You are sufficiently interested yes. to come and drive up here. So it, it, it is obviously something. It is also true that lots of people that are very much in, interested and invested in Tesla are usually either software engineers or coming from the battery side or coming from the manufacturing side and less people come from the finance side, right? Yes. I, I think finance is actually only discovering Tesla. They were initially so negative that it takes them still time to get positive about it. And few seem to have put their butt into the car because that's what you should do, right? Um, so the if we can help having a certain angle from the financial markets, I'm most happy to do it. I love doing it. Sally Munro introduced us to the technical side of True. Tesla Automotive. A lot of people who watch like Tesla teardowns I'm not into cars. I'm not a car person mm -hmm. and I watch every single video. True, me too. Now, yourself and someone like Gary Black, mm -hmm. you're bringing the finance perspective into Tesla. True, I true. never knew what an Altman Z score was until a couple of weeks ago when <laughs> you started talking about it. Yeah. Uh, to many retail investors, the this same. is new. Yeah. And you're giving us a look into the financial markets, institutional investors. Mm -hmm. That's eye opening. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So, I want to call out here that you're actually doing a lot more for us than just oh, telling us to you. buy Tesla stock. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, I mean, I, I love sharing it. Like I told you, I have five children. I love educating. It's always been part of my job. So it's always been part of my journey. And so I'm very happy I can help a little bit. Thank you. One of your other gifts is that you are able to see things with a critical mind. Mm -hmm. True. I want to ask, what's the biggest blind spot for Tesla investors today? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, Elon and his genius, his health, his personality, that's obviously, a, um, I wouldn't say a blind spot, but it's a risk for Tesla, right? So um, I was always hoping that he would more focus on, on the technical side, right? The same role he plays for SpaceX, that he would find that role within Tesla and let other people run the operations or the CEO role, whatever he wants to give up. So that's a little bit mine because I mean, I'm not just a blind follower. There are moments where I just go, yeah, it would have been good to not open your mouth or not tweeting this tweet, right? He sometimes gets himself, he knows he gets himself into, into trouble. Um, the, other, the other thing that I still feel is lacking is, um, that retail investors are represented on the board of Tesla. Tesla's board currently has nine members, family members, uh, employees, and and, uh, and 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 venture capitalists and people that are in the market, no doubt about it. But I feel that us retail investors, we have quite a voice. Um, as we discussed, and actually Elon uh, acknowledged, we have much more analysis than all these people around, right? Um, but but I don't think it gets all the time up to the to, to the board level of, of Tesla and has the response. Because I think if it would be us retail investors, we would have more communication on subjects like safety, on uh, new product development, how, when they do they come, how do they roll them out, more statistics. I'm, I'm always um, uh, astonished that we don't have um, car deliveries broken up by continents, mm. right? I mean, there are a couple of things where I just think if there would be one person sitting in there defending the retail investors, I think that person would be heard because what, what we're asking is not out of the world, but it's just getting lost in the whole rest of the, the things. Fair. Mm. What I'm hearing is having at least some retail investor representation in the board of directors. Tesla has been amazing and Martin Becker has been amazing in oh, calling sure. out, thanking our retail investors yes even in the annual shareholders meeting. True. In Singapore, we're fortunate to have the world's third largest retail Tesla investor. True, Leo. So after Elon and Larry Ellison mm. is uh, Professor Leo Koguan. Mm. I was fortunate enough to meet him recently. And one of the things he's been talking about on Twitter, I think some of you call it out as well, is Tesla could be ready for stock buybacks. Yes. Not dividends because there's a little bit more strict and rigid. Yeah. Stock buybacks allow more fluidity. Yes. Apple has let, shown the path many years ago already and that voice is helpful yeah i i absolutely appreciate leon and he has been the the forerunner of this subject he actually inspired me when i was looking into when did apple get upgraded what impact did it have how many more institutional investors came in and all that and then i suddenly realized 
check out what happened with the shares and then it just it became obvious that the whole setup was done to to buy back shares and retire and then when you see what the price did at the same time and sometimes i just feel that elon doesn't care about the price elon doesn't have this you know intense wish of getting the stock price higher i mean us retail investor we do this is our fortune this is our money in there we're ready to you know to put even more money into it if we ever have so but we want to be sure that it is at its, its at its price and whenever i talk to somebody and say look today the stock price is at 300 dollars they would go yeah but it's worth 500 right or it's worth 600 or whatever and so this this difference is to me a sign that the, the stock is still suppressed right and that that there are elements in there and leo has been very very good at at, at pointing it out and pointing out solution and uh, the stock buyback is one and so there are two two ways of doing stock buyback one is buying it back and just keeping it as if you're carrying a stock in your in your balance sheet right as if you're just having some some equity stock and you value it every day and it's part of your cash position right or the second is you buy it back and you retire it and so this stock doesn't exist anymore afterwards and that is obviously a real gift to the current investors because the float gets lower and you just have automatically a higher stock price because you have now a bigger uh, part of your pie yes mm -hmm. for retail investors our incentives and motivations are clear we mm -hmm. want the stock price to go up sure for elon he's really the richest person in the world he clearly doesn't care that much about money mm -hmm. and i think it's even worse than that i think he also doesn't want the price to go up that high because he will lose employees when yes. employees become millionaires or multimillionaires, they don't want to work anymore yes. right and since they most of those employees have uh, stock options if they become very rich with their stock uh, it is obviously not in his interest losing his employees yes right now there is no urgency for elon to see the stock price go up right it's all it's okay to be in status quo, it's okay to go up as long as it doesn't go down. Mm. It doesn't need to moon anytime exactly. soon. Exactly. There's clearly a difference of our interests, yes. Alexandra, I've learned so much. Thank you so much for your insights. It's been a pleasure, Darren. Thank you. Anytime. So Alexandra has a YouTube channel called Tesla oh, Boomer tiny, Mama. Yeah, a tiny little bit. Just for my couple of, you know, interviews or when I was going into the ESG rabbit yeah. hole and I use it. It's I'm not a regular YouTuber, but I want to have my little channel whenever I need that. I also I think I'm actually more active on Substack. So uh, if people want to subscribe to my Substack, that's where I do my analysis part. I'll put a link down to the Substack. Thank you. And the YouTube channel for Tesla Boomer Mama, where you'll find videos on ESG investing. Yes. She interviews other institutional investors as well. Yeah, I do. Correct. Thank you for this Thank you conversation. I loved it. Thank On you for coming. Lovely Saturday afternoon here in Santa Barbara. True. True. Thanks for coming. It's a beautiful coastal city. I recommend checking out Santa Barbara one day. If you found this video useful, please click the like button. True. Hit subscribe to join me on our journey to meet more of the Tesla global community. Mm -hmm.